Hello, everybody. I think we're going to get started here. That's a great costume. <laughs> um, so welcome to the hero in all of us, empowering students through our modern mythologies. I'm Dylan Demers. I'm Roy Joe Sarton. And I'm Stephen Huddleston. And we're going to be presenting to you uh, several different versions of the mono myth as seen through some more modern television and movies and that kind of thing. So sort of our goals for this presentation are to first of all explain to you what the monument is. Does anybody here like Star Wars? Everybody? <laughs> you can thank Mr. Joseph Campbell who came up with the monument because George Lucas basically followed it entirely. Um, so that's our first goal is to explain to you what that is, which we'll be doing with Moana. Hopefully you've heard of it. Um, and we're also going to hopefully accomplish the goal of how you can use this in your classroom, which brings me to my second thing to ask. Uh, how many teachers are in here? So a lot. <laughs> um, students? A few. And anyone else who's just interested? <laughs> so we're going to start with basically basic explanation of what the uh, monument is, the hero's journey. Um, Moana is a pretty classic version of this tale, and as you can see from the PowerPoint up here, or the handouts that are being handed out right now, it's a pretty structured, circular kind of thing. So your first thing is the call to adventure. Your hero starts out in normalcy, and then they get called to adventure, whatever that may be. Um, and then there's a threshold where they kind of push into it and they start their trials and challenges as they start their adventure. And they usually, along this that stage, meet a few archetypes that will be present with them throughout the rest of their journey, including their mentor. If they were Star Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi, or Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. Um, and they have a helper generally, which would be a sidekick, generally. And then, as they're going through their challenges, they reach the abyss. Whether that be a literal hell or the lowest point in their story, whatever it is, it's a transformative moment for them, where they become something more than the kid who set out however long ago on this journey. And then you reach the full completion of that transformation is generally the climax of the story. And then you have the triumph and return home. And then generally it starts all over again. So, with Moana, she gets her call to adventure early. If you've seen the movie, uh, her grandmother tells her the story of Maui stealing the heart. Um, and she's fascinated by that. And then in typical Disney fashion, they have a song that is literally calling her to adventure. <laughs> How far I'll go. Literally calling her to adventure. Is it, is it? That wasn't enough. Then her grandmother's dying words are telling her to go do this, find Maui, and go on this adventure and save our island. Very obvious. Great for elementary students. Disney movies almost always follow this pattern. And then she begins her trials. The first is actually after she sets out, her, her boat flips in the sea. And the sea actually turns out to be something of a helper for her because she shipwrecks, but she shipwrecks on Maui's Island, who turns out to be something of a mentor for her. A reluctant mentor, but a mentor nonetheless. And her first trial is really convincing him to help her return the heart of Phoebe and restore, basically, peace, happiness, prosperity to the world, and more specifically, her island. Um, and then she begins more serious challenges after meeting with Maui for the first time and convincing him to go out with her. So, she encounters a series of things, the coconut pirates. Maui's terrified of them, but Moana's not. She's willing to fight back. And then after that, they reach what is essentially a literal hell for her. The realm of monsters. They have to delve into the realm of monsters <coughs> to uh, retrieve Maui's bush, fish hook so that he can help her more along her quest. Um, in a lot of stories, it's more of a figurative hell. In Disney, it's almost always 
a literal underworld, realm of monsters, whatever it be. But in this moment, when she enters there, she shows that she's a true hero, whereas Maui can't defeat the crab. She kind of tricks him and figures it out. And she starts becoming the true hero of this story as she saves him and escapes with his fish hook. Which is where we reach sort of, we're entering the climax of the story. The uh, battle with Teka. Maui is unable to defeat this giant lava demon. Um, but Moana is persistent. Even after they fail the first time, she's not willing to give up. She wants to go back at it, try it again, and complete her quest. Whereas Maui gives up and runs away. So she goes back on her own and braves the fire demon, Teka, and almost gets there. And Maui, of course, returns and helps her out a little bit and makes sure she gets through. And where she truly becomes a hero, she realizes that Teka is not really a demon. It's Teki without her heart. So she doesn't even have to do some epic battle with the monster. She figures out her love and compassion and all those sorts of things. But this is just Teki without her heart. Shows her the heart, says her real name, and she becomes Teki once more. And thus, she completes her quest. She succeeds in the quest, whereas Maui failed. She succeeds and becomes a true hero, completely different from the little girl long ago who only longed about going out onto the open sea, and becomes the hero that went out, faced a ton of crazy stuff, and came back successful. And this is where she returns home triumphantly. Um, she successfully saved her island. She becomes a new chief of her people. And she's completed her cycle as a hero. But why is any of this important to you, or your classroom, or your students? Because really, when we're walking through life, we're all walking through our own hero's journey. If you're an elementary school student starting your first day of school, that's your, that's your call to adventure, where you're going to go through your trials, where you're going to do tests and meet new people, uh, learn the social norms, learn new things, and perhaps struggle. And then finally, graduate from elementary school, and you start it all over again in middle school and again in high school. And then after that, maybe you have to get a job, or you go to college. And believe me, I just graduated college. It's scary as hell graduating college and having to find a job. <laughs> but it's a new call to adventure. It's the next step in our life. Everybody has to do these things. And through learning this, we can learn more about ourselves and realize that it's not as bad as it seems maybe. We can all be a hero. You don't have to be a prince or princess or a great warrior to go on some adventure. Your life is that adventure. And hopefully through this kind of thing, you can show your students or, or yourself or your kids that sort of thing. Now, the hero's journey does get more complex than Disney movies, as I'm sure you're surprised to hear, <laughs> uh, which is why Stefan here will be coming up to talk to you about this year's hit, Black Panther. It looks like maybe you guys have heard of Black Panther. <laughs> no. um, so like Dylan was saying, um, the hero's journey can be this very straightforward, simple story. And it can be something that we all go through several times in our lives. We go through a cycle and we start one journey and we complete it. Sometimes we start several journeys at the same time and complete them at different times. Um, these things are ongoing, and they can be very small things. Like you said, it doesn't have to be saving the world. It can be things that may seem insurmountable to us. I think sometimes we forget as adults when we are talking to children, when we're talking to younger people, that their problems seem insignificant sometimes from an adult perspective when they're talking about you know, losing a friend or something like that. But to them, that's their world. They don't have bills and responsibilities and things to measure that against. That is their world. And so that journey can come from different perspectives for different people. So when we look at Black Panther, Black Panther can be something that you can use to teach younger kids the, the basic hero's journey, right? 
he gets his call to adventure, right? We see the death of his father. He now has to become king. He now has to become the Black Panther. We see his, his meeting and his supernatural aid, right? That he goes through this process where he has to kind of prove that his right to be the king and everything like that. We see him go through trials and tests, right? He literally goes to the underworld. He has to essentially go to this place where he sees the spirit of his father and his ancestors. So it has all the hallmarks of the standard hero's journey. But the movie also now takes us to another level. It goes, it goes to something else. And we see a kind of a deeper version of how we can look at the hero's journey and what we can learn from it or what we can teach using the hero's journey. So we get to see T'Challa go through this process where um, he meets his, you know, he goes through this process with his cousin, Kil you know, Killmonger, right? And he understands that he's a representation of the shadow self, the darker side of, of himself, something where he's taking another view. And there's this battle that's going on between them about what Wakanda should do. Should Wakanda stay hidden? Or should Wakanda engage with the world? We see a new process of roles and rules that they're going through. And again, you see both of them kind of descend into this underworld where they're looking back at their ancestors. They're looking back at their spirits. And they come up with two very different ideas and very different paths about what they should do, about what Wakanda should do based on their experiences. Same thing, we get more complexities in the journey. You have people within Wakanda who are looking at what should we do. You have the leader of the war dogs, like he wants revenge for what happened to his family. You see Claw, who's kind of this force in the film of chaos, and we bring in these other themes now that can be kind of entry to learning about things like colonialism and slavery and those questions about the impact of those things and what they had. So now it's the hero's journey, but we're gonna put these deeper things on them. And by doing that, we raise these questions of the processes and the transformation that these characters go through, especially that T'Challa goes through as Black Panther and King and the realizations that he comes to when he really takes a hard look at the world and he takes a look at what Killmonger has to say and he sees this side of things and he starts to ask those questions. So because of those hard questions, we can look at that and we can take those ideas for the educators in the room or even for the students and for people who are just looking through processes, right? We can say, how can we take this for, to, for edu uh, educating children, especially if we looked at this story being something that we could go with for middle schoolers, even in the high school. And we can talk about these issues and we can start, and this is a, as an entry to colonialism and slavery, like I said, but then we can tie them into things like bullying. When you see bullying, do you choose to hide yourself away and take that process that Wakanda took and not engage? Or do you say, I need to tell someone about this. I need to do something. I need to go tell someone that this is going on. And that's the process of do we, do we hide ourselves away just like Wakanda had done for years? Or are we going to engage with the world? And the same can be especially when kids are at that age and they're trying to engage, meet new friends. Especially middle school can be a very awkward time. You're trying to kind of understand yourself and at the same time understand those around you and things like that. So that kind of ties also back into that idea of looking out and understanding and whether or not you're going to engage the world and how you're going to engage the world. Yes? No, no. College, and do we have the same issues because they came from middle school and high school? <coughs> yes. Um, so, one of the things I was wondering, how would you um, kind of, um, I find my biggest issue is students are afraid to be wrong because they've either been told that they were wrong or they're stupid or they're just afraid to pursue the thought. 
about the process because they're being mm -hmm. wrong and they would rather not do it at all than to be wrong. Yeah, and that's that's a tough one, right? So we're trying to we're trying to break that social stigma of asking for help. And so when we're trying to break that stigma, I think we have some things that we get from Black Panther and from the film that we can use as a process to teach how it's okay to be wrong, right? And you see this character in T'Challa, he comes to that realization at the end, hiding ourselves away wasn't the thing to do, it was wrong, right? And he comes to that process, we need to engage with the world and not be, and he's okay in making that choice. He's okay in saying, look, we messed up, and, and this is what came of it. And so it's a very tricky thing, of course, to try and remove that stigma, but I think by showing that you have characters who make choices, and you use the hero's journey who make choices that are not immediately the right choice. I mean, he loses the power of the Black Panther for a while. He's kind of cast out. He's thrown into the river. Everyone thinks he's dead. And so he goes through these trials. And that, that process of, of that questioning and that stigma of asking for help is, I think, part of that same journey. Yes? I just want to add to that, because I think the women in the movie also have a really strong role in that when the female warriors choose to go against their new king yes. and fight with T'Challa, and then also when one of the women female warriors uh, has that iconic line where she's like, for Wakanda my love, without yes. question, like that proves her conviction and her willingness to engage in that thought process of like, I could lose the one I love, I could lose my job, but I know what I'm doing. Yes. Right. And that's, and that's like a perfect thing as well, right? We have, um, in, in the film Black Panther, we have this amazing collection of strong women who aren't, they're not these cookie cutter archetypes. They're distinct. Each one is different. You have, you have uh, Okoye who's like this great general and everything like that. She's, she's a leader, she's fierce, she's gonna stand up for what she believes in. You have Nakia, who's kind of this voice of conscience and compassion and things like that, and then Shuri, who's like absolutely amazing, is like this tech genius yeah. of, she's, I, I can't even describe her. <laughs> <laughs> she's phenomenally amazing. Yes. So, so yeah, and I, and I love that you guys have asked this question and also brought up this observation and that the conversation is kind of going in this direction because that's one of the cool things about teaching the hero's journey to any level of student, right, at any age, because the heroes in the, the classic hero's journey, who follow this classic monomyth, they're not perfect. Mm -hmm. They screw up. Mm -hmm. They make mistakes, right? Like, they don't yeah. get it right. And, and in fact, like the example that Dylan gave us, right, like even Maui, who's this helper for Moana, he screws up too. Right, and so it can show it can show students that it's okay to screw up and learn from the mistakes that you make, and then come out the other side, and then make another choice. Right, the hero's journey is all about choices. What 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 challenges are presented to the hero? What choice does the hero make? And then what are the consequences of that choice? And what does the hero mm -hmm. have to do as a result? Right, and Black Panther does, yeah. it demonstrates this really well, as Stefan was saying, with both T'Challa and with Killmonger. Right, like faced with with these different choices and they, 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 they arrive at very different conclusions and are pursuing very different paths and then we see what happens when those paths come together and clash. And so it's, yes. it, it's, it's a great chance for students to see that the hero, right, I mean, as you guys all know, right, the heroes, even superheroes, are not super perfect. Um, but the hero's journey really showing them that it is a journey with all of these challenges and quests and the hero comes through those, but the hero is not like, perfectly successful and super on top of it the whole time. And, and I think that maybe that can help encourage students maybe to, to try things and fail, that you know you, you can come through the other side. Yeah, I think it's like cultivating this culture of it being okay to fail, right? You have, you know, Thomas Edison didn't invent the light bulb on his first try. He had to go through thousands and thousands of prototypes to create. He got one to work, right? Yeah, question is? That's what we're teaching kids now. Yes. So as they come up to middle school and high school, they're going to be prepared to fail. 
Good, good. Yeah. That's an elementary school, that's what we're teaching them. Yeah, good. growth mindset, right? The growth yeah. mindset, yes. right? Like the awesome. willingness to try. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, that, and that's, that's spectacular. I think when you look at characters like this, as Rojo said, you see not only on a personal level, right, do the characters fail, where he promises, I'm going to go get Claw, and he comes back and has to face that, like, I didn't get him, right? We see characters fail as individuals, but we also see failures on, like, a national level. Wakanda was making this choice to stay hidden for such a long time, and T'Challa decides that wasn't the right thing to do. So, that also says that that failure is not something that's an isolated thing to an individual. That failure is a wider thing, and that it's nothing to be ashamed of. You just have to try and do what you can to turn it around. Yes. Yeah, and I think I think part of the, the that success failure I think is maybe too hard of an edge for kids because they don't want to fail because mm -hmm. there's so such stigma. But maybe it's a growth, like the growth right. mindset. We're taking a risk and just trying. And then what did you learn from it? Yes. So it's kind of, I'm going to take some steps forward. What happened? Oh, I might have to take a step back. I might have to take some more yes. steps forward. So I think it's how, sometimes how we frame it sem semantically. Mm -hmm. um, what words do we put on it? And then, then what's the reaction from those around you? Yes. And, and, and then every time asking, how'd you grow? Yes. Not what'd you get out of it, because that, that is... Right. That's so gains driven. driven. Yes. Yes. How did you grow? Yeah. What did you learn from it? Right. There's a there's a process there, and I think so long as you're learning something from it, right? That's the key. You're you're not continually trying the exact same thing and failing. Right? And I think this film does a great job of that. Absolutely. Because, because at every step, his his all main characters we see growth. Yes. Yes. And even the bad guy. Yes. So yes. We see him grow. We do, we do, and we see we see everyone come to these realizations, and that realization is the key. That oh wait a minute, okay, that did not work. This wasn't working. I need to try something else, and I think that's all part of the growing process. That I think now it adds that layer, and I think it's important, especially for kids to see, and for young people just starting out. I think it's important for them to see that role models can fail, that heroes can fail, that anyone can fail, and that it's not anything to be ashamed of so long as we learn something from it. And I think that's an important process to go through. And that's what this movie kind of brings into it. And so now in that process of talking about the hero's journey, we're going to look at something that's even more complex. And we're going to look at, Roy Joe's going to talk about Sherlock Holmes, uh, a character who's uh, also not very famous. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and how we see different um, archetypes reflected in the character and how those can help us kind of reflect on ourselves. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so you want to talk about a flawed hero, right? Yeah. Like, you want to talk about somebody who, who doesn't, I mean, frankly, isn't the typical hero. Um, let's talk about Sherlock Holmes, right? He he embodies, and, and so what I'm going to talk to you about is less about the hero's journey, right? Because Sherlock doesn't really adhere to the, ship, to the hero's journey in, in a way that, that these other characters do. He doesn't have that kind of story arc. He was created to do that. Um, it, I, so I'm going to talk to you instead about three characters from the Sherlock Holmes canon um, and how they embody archetypes that you see in the hero's journey, right? Like they, they embody these three archetypes. Um, and we're going to get, and we're going to see kind of the same issues that we've just been talking about here, right? It's like flaws, mistakes, growth, or not growth, right? Because we're going to bring more party into this as as a as, as a double for Sherlock, okay? And I should just say as a caveat here, um, Sherlock is the most famous, I would say, of the heroes on our panel today. Um, he was created in 1887 by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote more than 60 original stories about him. He's been adapted in print by more than 100 authors. Um, he's been played by more than 75 actors in more than 250 films and TV shows. So um, Sherlock is, is, is in the Guinness Book of World Records as the, world, as the most portrayed character ever. Okay. Um, and because of that, obviously, I'm not going to be able to speak to elements of, from the entire canon, and I'm going to actually pull 
specific images and some specific quotes for you um, directly from the, the series uh, that you see demonstrated for you here, starting at Cambridge <coughs> and Mark Freeman, that's one and it's in Peabody's and started in 2010. Okay, so just, just so you know, that's where I'm gonna pull um, um, some examples for you, but the things that we're gonna talk about with these characters really apply across, for, for the most part, across the planet. Um, so Sherlock is a hero is, he, he embodies some typical hero qualities, right? Some typical, and, and like the concept of an archetype, right? Like uh, psychologist Carl Jung calls archetypes these, these concepts that exist in the collective human consciousness. Right, such that, that when we as humans see one of these, we can immediately identify it. Um, and and you know, whether that is something that's evolutionary or whether it is cultural, right, like that's still open for debate. But these are concepts, these, these kinds of characters are things that translate across cultures. And the hero's journey is too. Joseph Campbell, um, who, who we were talking about earlier, it was a comparative mythologist, and he traveled around the world collecting myths from cultures on every continent, and discovered that there was this, this common myth amongst all these cultures, this common heroic myth that had these similar elements, and that's why he termed it the monomyth, as Dylan said, right? Like, that it was this, this myth that transcended culture, transcended national boundary, transcended, um, you know, physical but geographical boundaries, it was something that united people from all over the world, this hero's journey. You see it in these mythologies everywhere. And you see these archetypal characters that inhabit the journey, you see them everywhere too, okay? And so, so the qualities that Sherlock displays are archetypal heroic qualities, okay? Um, superhuman abilities, yeah. Um, triumph over forces of evil, sure, okay? Um, fallibility to the sin of pride. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? A fall through some kind of heroic <coughs> sacrifice that ends in his death often. Okay. Um, and this death will mitigate the sin of the hero, right? Turn him into a hero, and then oftentimes, oftentimes, but not always, he comes back from it in some way. Okay, and so Sherlock, right, we can tick off those boxes. Um, but when we think about the character of Sherlock, we, we have to remember that, that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who created Sherlock, did not create him as a hero. Um, he created him as a hyper-observant puzzle solver and a drug addict, right? Uh, with high levels of specialized knowledge about some things and willful ignorance, right? Complete and willful ignorance about others. Um, in other words, he was flawed from the start. And even though he's been reinterpreted, you know, all these times for more than a century, and his character has um, come to represent in our cultural lexicon intellectual qualities of superhuman proportions, he has remained in every incarnation human and inherently flawed as a human. Okay. Um, his flaws include an addictive personality. Uh, willful ignorance of subjects that are not relevant to his crime puzzles, because that's his primary focus, and a selfish focus on himself and those puzzles. Okay. Thus, um, he's not noble by nature. Two defenses. Um, he doesn't adventure for others. He doesn't go on a quest because he's called to an adventure and he goes to do it right. He's unlike Moana and uh, T'Challa in this respect. He's not called to some higher adventure to, to save other people, he, he doesn't do that. Um, he only gets involved in things for his own enjoyment of the couple. And it's these flaws that make him human and relatable. So this is a terrific quote from season two, episode three, The Reichenbach Fall, uh, where Watson, this is actually what Watson says at Sherlock's grave, he believes that Sherlock is dead at this point, sorry, spoilers. Um, uh, you, want, you told me that you weren't a hero. Uh, there were times I didn't even think you were human, but let me tell you this, you were the best man and the most human human being um, that I've ever known, and no one will ever convince me that you told me a lie. And that's significant coming from John Watson, given the archetypes that John Watson represents in the Sherlock canon, right? Watson is both the helper companion archetype as well as the healer archetype. Um, the helper companion archetype um, is, is a helper and a companion, a sidekick, if you will, if you're 
here you see John doing the sidekick thing, right? Walking next to Sherlock, um, you know, supporting Sherlock as he's out, as he's out solving puzzles. Um, the helper also acts as something of a double for the hero. Um, sometimes providing the hero with something that the hero doesn't have, okay? Sometimes acting as conscience. Um, the healer archetype also does this as well, usually acting as a spiritual guide for the hero. So John Watson, of course, is Dr. John Watson, so that healer thing clicks in really well there, but, but, but John doesn't function as like Sherlock's physical doctor. He, he functions as Sherlock's spiritual guide and as his conscience. Okay. And so in this role, John constantly drags Sherlock's attention away from the puzzle and back to the people. Right? So in this great um, exchange, and, and the, photo, the image is actually not from this episode, it's actually an image from another episode, but I just, I just love Watson's, I love Martin Freeman's expression in this image. Um, this, is, this is an exchange from season one, episode three, The Great Game. Okay? And Watson says, there are lives at stake, at stake, Sherlock, actual human lives. Just so I know, do you care about that at all? Will caring about that help save them? Nope. Then I'll continue not to make that mistake. And you find that easy, do you? Says Watson. Um, yes, Harry, is that news to you? No. No. I've disappointed you. Right? Sherlock recognizes something there. I've disappointed you. That's good. That's a good deduction. Yeah. Don't make people into heroes, John. Heroes don't exist, and if they did, I wouldn't be one of them. Okay. So, so we have John um, as the conscience for Sherlock, who is our very flawed hero. Then the other archetype that we have to bring into this mix is Moriarty. There he is. There he is. So Moriarty is, um, is, is three different archetypes. I mean, at least three different archetypes. He can, he can represent at least three. The trickster, the devil, and the shadow self for Sherlock, right? As the trickster, he deceives and changes, right? So if you know anything about Moriarty in this series, you know that Moriarty is constantly changing. He pretends to be Molly's boyfriend. He, he allows Mycroft to capture him and torture him. He poses as an actor hired by Sherlock to play Moriarty, right? There's all these layers of that, and at one point he even says, I'm so changeable, right? It's one of his great lines. He, he is that trickster figure. Um, he's also a devil figure, okay? The devil archetype is a negative figure that is evil incarnate to true tempts the hero with something um, in exchange for the hero's soul, right? And so Moriarty is constantly trying to get Sherlock to play with him and, and ignore all of the other things that Sherlock should be should be paying attention to, right? Trying to get Sherlock to kind of come over to Moriarty's side and just selfishly focusing on the puzzle. Okay. Um, and this is why Moriarty is Sherlock's shadow self, right? Because he's also motivated by some of the same things that Sherlock is, the chase, the puzzle, right? The game's on. Um, but Moriarty's motivations remain selfish. Sherlock start that way, but because Sherlock has John Watson as his conscience, his motivations change over time, right? We see growth in him as a hero over time. And his motivations change in some cases, not always. But, but in some cases, they change, right? Um, and so, so in the lives of those that, are true, that he truly cares about are on the line, Sherlock learns that he's willing to do anything for them. And he grows as a result of that realization, right? So we see this growth in Okay, so, so this, this exchange between uh, Sherlock and Moriarty comes from season two, episode three, The Red Rock Fall, and on the rooftop of St. Bart's Hospital. Right, and it's at this moment that Moriarty has told Sherlock that Sherlock must commit suicide. He must come off the roof, and if he doesn't, his friends will be killed. Okay, so if Sherlock doesn't accede to Moriarty's wishes in this game that they are playing, um, then Sherlock's friends will be killed. Right? And Sherlock says um, that he's willing to do it. He says, I am you. Prepared to do anything. Prepared to burn. Prepared to do what ordinary people won't do. You want me to shake hands with you in hell, I shall not disappoint you. And Moriarty doesn't believe him. Right? Nah, you talk big. You're ordinary. You're ordinary. You're on the side of the angels. And Sherlock says, oh, I may be on the side of the angels, but don't think for one second that I am one. And I love this exchange because it, it shows us that, that right, like Sherlock has grown.
grown and his motivations are no longer purely selfish, but he is still true to his character, right? He still doesn't see himself as a good guy or as a hero, right? He's, 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 he, he, doesn't, he doesn't put himself in that category at all. And so I, I, I love this, this particular exchange here. So, so why use Sherlock um, to teach students about archetypes, right? Why use Sherlock to help students understand the hero's journey, understand concepts of heroes, right? Why? Sherlock is, as my husband told me before, why? when I told him I was going to do this, he's like, how can you talk about Sherlock as a hero? He's a drug addict. And I said, yeah. I said, but, I said, you know, yes, right? He is flawed. The guy is totally flawed, and that's what makes him totally relatable, right? Because we witness Sherlock grappling with and navigating the consequences of his own pride and his own weaknesses, and it prompts us to reflect on our own, right? Pride and weaknesses and consequences thereof. Um, how does our pride, how do our weaknesses shape our own actions? How do they shape our relationships? Um, how can we change or grow um, if we don't like what we see when we think about that, okay? Um, as we see Sherlock tempted and taunted by Moriarty, right? We also are prompted to think about the things that challenge us, right? What are our Moriarty's? What are our students' Moriarty's? How do they hinder us? How do they threaten us? How do they give us chances to make choices? And how do they give us chances to grow? Um, but I think, I think possibly the most important archetype here is the one that's not as flashy. It's the one that actually doesn't get as much press. We're always talking about Sherlock and Moriarty. But I actually think John Watson is the, the really key archetype um, here for students. Uh, it prompts us to think about what it means to be a friend and what it means to be a friend to someone that you might not fully understand who might make being a friend a little difficult. <laughs> Can you imagine being Sherlock's friend, right? John is loyal to Sherlock, despite the way Sherlock is. Um, John is by measures gentle and firm. He's a kind man who possesses an inner core of steel. And he is the conscience, not only of Sherlock, but of all the stories, right? John is at that, that, that place. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be a friend? How do we reconcile a friend's actions with a friend's heart? Um, how do we act in the face of danger, of ridicule, of infuriation, of love, um, when, we, when we have friends making choices like we see Sherlock making, okay? So, given that, okay, yep, given that, um, let's break into um, some groups. What we'd like you guys to do is to turn to, turn to some neighbors, okay? Um, and talk about how you might use heroic archetypes or a heroic journey to work with students in your classroom, or if you're not a teacher, right? How might you use this to talk to your kids or to your friends, right? To help them and you, right, grow as a result. So let's let's form some small groups and spend, spend about 10 minutes talking about that. Dylan and Stephen and I will come around and, and kind of hear what you guys are saying. <laughs> 